Good evening from the auditorium of West Junior High School in Shakopee, and welcome to the 2014 Scott County Board of Commissioners Candidates Forum. Tonight's debate is being sponsored by the Shakopee Chamber and Visitors Bureau and is hosted by Shakopee Public Schools. My name is Rob O'Neill. I'm the pastor of Brookwood Community Church and a member of the Chamber of Commerce. I'll serve as tonight's moderator. Our candidates this evening for District 3 are Mrs. Deb Barber, and current District 55A Representative Mike Beard. Our candidates for District 5 are Mr. Arnie Andreessen and County Commissioner John Ulrich. Would you please welcome our candidates now? By district, our candidates are arranged this evening in alphabetical order by last name. Candidates will be given two minutes to make opening statements, after which I'll have the opportunity to ask them questions. Candidates will then have one minute to respond to each one of these questions. In some cases, their opponents will be given 30 seconds for rebuttal. And as moderator, I'll have the opportunity to ask a follow-up question. Follow-up responses will be allowed 30 seconds. Each candidate will now have an opportunity to make their one minute opening statement and we will begin this evening with Ms. Ms. Barber. Good evening and thank you so much to the Shakti Chamber for hosting this event tonight. They said my name is Dem Barber and I'm running for Scott County Commissioner in District 3 here in Shakopee. I'm running because I believe it's time for a new perspective and time for new leadership on the Scott County Board. Why new and why now? Well, Shakopee has changed a great deal over the last 10 years. We've increased in size, we have added businesses, and we have changed to this very diverse city. With that, I think it's now a good opportunity to have new representation on the county board. I don't bring to this board, uh, or wouldn't bring to this position, many years of political experience like my opponent, but I do bring great expertise. I have a background in business, engineering, and active community involvement. I've been involved in many committees and boards, from the schools, to the city, to the county. In each of those instances, I've had the opportunity to take leadership roles. I think I can take that and transfer that experience and history to become the next Scott County Commissioner. Like I said, I think it's important to have some new leaders and new representation. There's always a point in time in a community where everything evolves and new leaders need to step up. Right now, I would like to step up to be the next leader and to serve Shakopee and District 3 on the Scott County Board. And just to clarify, these are two-minute opening statements. I misspoke. Representative Beard, two-minute opening statement. Thank you, Rob. And thank you to the Shakopee Chamber for having us here tonight. This is the fourth time my opponent and I have appeared side by side in the last month or so. So uh, I think we could almost give each other's opening statements anymore. But it's a good thing for you to hear us talk and hear, hear us talk about ourselves, talk about why we think we'd be a good candidate. And I think in this case, Scott County is well served. You've got uh, my opponent is a worthy a candidate, a worthy opponent. I have some strengths too and I'm going to talk about those for a little bit. My wife Karen and I have been residents of the town for 28 years. I know that sounds like a really long time, but when you're in Old Town Shakopee, we're still considered the new kids. Isn't that amazing? In those 28 years, though, we put four kids through the Shakopee schools, had all 13 of our grandchildren born at St. Francis. My wife has worked at St. Francis and now with the Alina system, probably taking care of some of your grandmas and grandpas around town. She should actually be the candidate, I would think. Tongue firmly in cheek, by the way. Scott County is on, has been on a growth tear. Scott County is a county that I've been very proud of to serve these last 12 years in St. Paul. You're in a rather unique position. Scott County was a county I like to brag about down there because we do things a little different than the other 86 counties in this state. We're the only county in the state with scale, where all the townships, uh, city, county, and school board people get together once a month just to get to know each other and talk things through before they come. Excuse me, become big issues. We're also one of the only counties in the state that um, have the lowest tax rate in the state. As fast as we've grown and as prosperous as our county is, this county has been very well run. When the big budget crunch hit, even our 19 uh, unions pulled together to work with the administration to protect every one of our employees so there didn't have to be layoffs. No other county could say that. I've learned that we're also in perilous times though, working with the Met Council. There's things on the horizon that are going to take a steady hand on the tiller. They're going to take a little bit of um, experience and wisdom with the people in St. Paul at the state level. 
and I think I'm gonna bring that to the, to the campaign and I'd like to talk more about that as we go forward. Thank you again for having us here tonight. Mr. Andreasen. Thanks, Rob. My name is Arnie Andreasen. I'm from Savage. I've been a 23-year resident of Savage. Raised my family there. My wife Gail and I still live there. Um, we have three, three children. Uh, Arnie's junior is 27. He's a pharmacist at the University of Michigan Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My daughter Erica, Jesse Erica says hi, um, is a young life worker here uh, in the South Metro area. It's a high school outreach program for, uh, Christian outreach program for, for high school students. And my youngest is a 13 year old, Zachary, who is a eighth grader at Eagle Ridge Junior High School in Savage. We're members of St. John the Baptist Parish and my wife and I have volunteered in the religious education program at both the youth and adult level over the over a number of years, and I also sing in the choir there. I've been coaching youth um, sports in Savage and Burnsville for over 20 years as a head coach in football, basketball, and baseball, and have, have had a uh, unique experience of getting to know many of the families. I, I think I probably coached over a thousand kids um, in the Savage Burnsville area over the years. So a lot of a lot of kids and a lot of young adults call me co still call me coach. It's great to see those kids um, as they've grown up and become young young men and women. Um, the reason I'm running for county commissioner is I feel it's our civic duty uh, to use our talents and our gifts to for the betterment of our families, our neighborhoods, and our communities. And I feel that I can be a positive influence on the Scott County Board. My experience um, as a volunteer within Savage has given me a unique opportunity to get to know a lot of people in the community. And my work experience, I think, also lends itself strongly to serving as a county commissioner. I have worked for over 25 years in the, in the, in the capacity of a project manager. And in that process, have worked to identify problems, come up with solutions to those problems, share those solutions with the customers, and then implement those, those, those solutions. So again, I think I'm very well um, suited to be a county commissioner. Commissioner Ulrich. I'm John Ulrich, Scott County Commissioner. I'd like to take a minute and talk about uh, the honor and responsibility and even joy of being a Scott County Commissioner. This last week, on Tuesday, we had two different ribbon cuttings. We had a ribbon cutting at Emerson, where there was 500 new jobs, livable wage jobs, high paying jobs really. And then an uh, hour later we had a ribbon cutting at 169 and 69. And those were really great things to celebrate. And one led to the other. The, the road projects that we've been working on lead to development and economic development. And I, I, I wanna make Scott County a, a better place to live, work and play. And, one of the areas I've been focusing on is transportation, and I led the debate that got the 494-169 interchange funded, and, and we've been working as, with our team to, to get all these road projects done, the 169 and 69 where we did the ribbon cutting, and then the new uh, 101 River Bridge, 13 and five. All of these projects contribute to economic development and, and bring jobs and, and, and make our community vital, and I get a great, joy out of that, I feel awesome, honor to be part of that, and I feel a real weight of responsibility to make our, our community a better place to live, work, and, and play, and, and enjoy, and, and so it was a great, great time to celebrate, and that's what I'm about, is working hard to make our community better, and I, I take that very responsibly as your county commissioner. Well, candidates, we will begin this evening with the topic of your hopes as you approach these positions. What is one area of county government that you believe you could positively influence if you were elected? And Representative Beard, we'll start with you. One area of county government I think I could positively affect if I was elected would probably be our transportation area. Uh, for 12 years I served on the transportation committee, six years as lead, two years as chair. I understand how dynamic, how important transportation is to a dynamic economy and the mobility of our citizens, the ability of them to live their lives. Now we have a pretty good system here now. But as I mentioned, there's clouds on the horizon known as the 2040 Thrive Minnesota Plan that directly threatens our ability to continue to be connected primarily with the rest of the metro area. That'd be one thing I'd want to change. I'd want to use the skill and the connections, the expertise I have in that area to drive that forward and to help, uh, help see us through the turbulence and make sure that we stay on the cutting edge of being accessible to the rest of the metro area. 
Mr. Andreasen, what is one area of county government that you believe you could positively influence if you were elected? I think there are many areas that we could uh, affect. I think one, one that I think is important to me and has been uh, with the volunteer work that I've done with youth in the in the area in the county, um, particularly in Savage, as I've seen the change in demographics that have taken place uh, within the county and, and continue to do so, and the needs of many of the the, fam the families of. of Broken families who had one parent or who are living with foster in foster care situations. That that's a, there's a there's a there's a passion in my heart to continue to work with those people and those those kids who are um, underprivileged, so to speak, to allow them to get, to get the proper education and put them in the right areas where they can succeed in life. Commissioner Ulrich, what's one area of county government that you believe you could positively influence if you're elected? I would say our county government is under threat from the plans of the Metropolitan Council and their overreach. They are uh, taking control of different areas from, from transit to parks and, and, and it's a dramatic overreach. They, in regard to transportation, they want to invest, over-invest in the urban core and, and spend money on transit ways and bike paths and, and under-invest in our highway system, which keeps our economy vital. Uh, from 2014 to 2022, they want to spend $72 million annually on congestion relief on our highways, which is next to nothing. And recently, I encouraged and rallied the five counties together to challenge the Met Council to meet with them. And I was chosen as their spokesman to uh, express our concerns in the direction the Met's Council is headed. So I would say that's a threat to county government that I, I want to speak up uh, for the county. Yeah. Ms. Barber, what's one area of county government that you believe you could positively influence if you were elected? I really think one area, and one area that's very uh, important to me that I could really focus on and have a positive effect on is economic development. I serve on the Economic Development Advisory Council for the City of Shakopee. I currently also serve on the First Stop Shop Advisory Board. The First Stop Shop is the economic development group for the county. Uh, there, along with me owning a business, just having that background and being able to talk to business leaders and interact with them, I think that would help, help the county show that they truly really are open for business. Some of the things we've done through the First Step Shop already are sending that message, and as we can obviously see through some of the great economic development gains we've had, but I think we have to be careful to not be stagnant and proactively continue that economic development. That helps lower our tax, or spread our tax base, helps the low, lower uh, individual property tax rates, and I think it would be really, really important. And I think it would send a really powerful message to the business community to elect a business leader to the Scott County Board. Well, candidates, political opinions invariably influence how we vote and how we make decisions. Despite the fact that this is a nonpartisan position, how might your personal political views influence how you serve Scott County? And how might your opponent's political views influence how they serve Scott County? And Mr. Andreasen, we'll begin with you. I believe that um, well, my, my personal views are fairly conservative, uh, both fiscally and socially, and I think that I would bring those to the uh, to the to the county in my service as county commissioner. I believe that uh, uh, we need to keep a line on taxes as as we go forward. We are a growing county. We have growing services. Uh, we have growing needs with our elderly and with with our with our youth. But I think those things have to be. Um, Put, put in place in terms of other developments such as uh, business development. I think the most important thing for us, the steps that we need to take, take for, first and foremost are working to establish a strong business development environment here in the county um, and to create more jobs. We, we've done a great job of that recently, but we are going to continue to be a growing community and we're going to continue to have people moving in this direction. So we need to continue to grow, grow jobs and development that will increase our tax base. Um, that tax base is going to allow us to do to do to do more of the services that we need to take care of in the county, also. But we need to make sure that we take care of those things first. Commissioner Ulrich, how might your personal political views influence how you serve Scott County, and how might your opponent's political views influence how they serve Scott County? You know, I'm not sure that they do. I don't think that uh, jobs are partisan or political, or roads are partisan or political or efficiency in government is or public safety is either or, or meeting human need outside of government like I did with fish. 
uh, when I help found that organization. I, I try and do what's right, what's best for the public, and you know, we all want to create jobs. We're all working for that. We're all wanting to build uh, congestion-free roads. We're all, all wanting to be efficient and not waste dollars. And, and I've been chair of the Regional Training Center for public, and public Safety and put forward initiatives like Code Red. And I've worked with the All Hazards Committee to, that deals with threats to it that we might face. And, and those, none of those are partisan. None of those are political. So I, 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 I enjoy being nonpartisan, nonpolitical, and working just for what people need. Ms. Barber, how might your personal political views influence how you serve Scott County and how might your opponent's political views influence how they serve Scott County? I personally really like this race because it's a nonpartisan race. It's a nonpartisan office, which means you get to do what's best and what's right or whatever party, but what do the citizens need? What do they need on a daily basis? And I think that is really what we seek to do in government, and this is a place that you can actually do that. Okay, Representative Beard, how might your personal political views influence how you serve Scott County, and how might your opponent's political views influence how they serve Scott County? Well, Rob and friends, let me start with the second part of that question first. I'm certain that my opponent has political views and has the way she processes things, but I would never presume to try to tell you what she's going to do or how she's going to react. I can only speak to myself. How my political views, I would like to rename that my values and the way I process things. I've served 12 years in a highly partisan environment where every amendment has a political purpose to play gotcha or catchy on a bad vote or something. Late nights at the Capitol drag on, mostly because people are playing political games. It's a very partisan place. Um, and that's probably by design. It's the way it's been for 150 some years we've been a state. I'm looking forward to moving to the county board. First of all, there's only five of us, not 201. It is nonpartisan, and I'm looking forward to no gotcha amendments in the middle of the night because, as I understand, we're usually done by 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Believe me, I'm looking forward to that. My value system, however, how I form my opinions, that will come into play on everything that I uh, decide and, and engage in the discussion on. Well, as we continue to think about serving in political office, how long can a person serve in elected political office and still be effective for their constituents? Commissioner Ulrich, we'll begin with you. You know, I think that varies. I think the judge of, of that answer to that question would relate to somebody's ideas, their innovation, their energy, uh, their commitment. Are they, are they fully engaged? You can tell when somebody's not fully engaged or are they no longer have ideas. I, I really... Uh, brought forward some ideas. I was on the ground floor of SCALE, which is our, all our leaders partner together to provide services more efficiently, and I've, I've been a part of that. I've been chair of that twice. I'm chair like for the third time uh, this next year. Uh, I helped found uh, FISH, which is a nonprofit uh, association of uh, nonprofit service groups, the faith community, local government, and business, all partnering together to be human need. Those are ideas, those are innovations, and, and, and the energy the person brings and the commitment should be the judge of how long they stay in the office. If they no longer have it, then they, it's time to step down. Ms. Barber, how long can a person serve in elected political office and still be effective for their constituents? Well, I'm guessing you're going to get some various answers because you've got some newbies and some people who've been in office for a while. But um, what I think is that when you look at any particular seat, like I said, you look at the, the community. Is the community need new representation? And I think the way Shakopee has changed so much that having new leadership at the board would be a good thing for our community at this point in time. Um, and I agree if, uh, with John. You have to have the passion to do it. And the other piece that you need is the engagement with the community. If you continue to engage and interact with the community in a direct basis as much as possible, that's where you're really knowing if you're impacting change. That's really knowing if you're getting the information that you need to make the best decisions for the citizens and really shows if you're being an effective representative or not. Representative Beard, how long can a person serve in elected political office and still be effective for their constituents? Well, I think that would depend on the voters. Since this is an open uh, representative democracy, it's up to the voters to decide. Uh, term limits, that's an interesting discussion to have, but let me point out that there was a fellow of the party opposite of mine, and I did not agree with him on very much, a fellow named Jim Oberstar, who served for 38 years in the Minnesota, the U.S. Congress. Uh, the voters finally turned him out. I think he missed a stop sign somewhere. Uh, but 
38 years that you could argue he was very effective because he kept bringing home the bacon and the pork for his district, much to the chagrin of the rest of us sometimes. But when you look at it from a district perspective, from that kind of what I would argue is a rather myopic view, yes, they can be very effective for their districts and hold the seat for a long, long time. There's something to be said for um, experience though, and I noticed this in the House of Representatives, uh, when people leave, the institutional knowledge sometimes walks out the door with them. If that can be reinvested somewhere else, I think the voters can benefit from that, and I think government can move on. There's gotta be some turnover, but there's something to be said for institutional knowledge and experience as well. Mr. Andreasen, how long can a person serve in political office and still be effective for their constituents? Well, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in term limits, and I think the reason I'm that way is we have it at the presidential level, um, and we have it, and I just, I just think it's important that we refresh the, uh, the citizenry every now and then, uh, that we need to bring in new people, new ideas, and we as, as, as citizens need to be involved more. And yeah, there's, there, there's a turnover issue with uh, losing experience and that sort of thing, although today with today's uh, electronics and our ability to archive information, I think it's less of an issue for us now, but I think it's important for us to, to make, make those changes on a regular basis for the sake of people being involved. I think our country's gotten to the place it's gotten to today because people have advocated their responsibility and allowed the politicians to, career politicians to run things for them. And I don't think the, the, the country's in a good place, and I don't think our state's in a good place. I'd like to keep our county in a good place, and I think term limits is the way to do that. Well, candidates, a number of you have mentioned, yes, Commissioner Ulrich. Yeah. Um, you know, I sat on the uh, Transportation Advisory Board, I've sat on it for 14 years, and, and, and it's a tedious board. There's sometimes it's not very exciting, it can be even boring. But when you're there, you build relationships, you, you gain experience, you gain knowledge, you, you, people begin to respect and trust you. And lo and behold, after sitting there for 10 of those 14 years, I had an opportunity to lead the debate on the 494-169 interchange. And just this last week, you know, Scott McBride, the area engineer for MnDOT, said, if I wasn't there, if I didn't lead that debate there on the Transportation Advisory Board, that interchange would not have been built which paved the way to a lot of jobs in Scott County. Well, thank you. Right, Mr. Andreas, in a um, rebuttal? I, I will not uh, deny that Mr. Ulrich has had significant uh, responsibilities and done a lot of stuff for the county. Um, but again, I would state that he doesn't do it on his own. I think that uh, other people are, are definitely involved in those things. and. Yeah, yeah, he's played his part, but it's, I think it's the importance of being able to refresh and get new people in there and for the people in general to be involved needs to happen. Well, candidates, several of you have already mentioned the topic of, of job growth in the area. What do you think the role of the Scott County Board should be in order to encourage local job growth? Ms. Barber, we'll begin with you. Certainly. Uh Right now, I think one of the biggest issues is that the Scott County Board can focus on related to economic development is to make sure that the first stop shop maintains its funding. Right now, it's currently funded through um, uh, scale and it's housed by the Scott County CDA. Now the first stop shop, what it does is it helps uh, in the entire county. It is a central area for the cities to come for information, resources to respond to economic issues, questions, concerns, uh, companies coming to them. It's a great concept. It's not been done before. Um, it's been something that we've been nationally recognized for because it's so unique. And I think that is something that it has to be a priority that we keep that entity uh, functioning. And and also as some of the activities coming out of the first stop shop was to be uh, focused more on customer service as, and in the interaction between businesses and the county and government as well. And we're working on supplying some of that information out to the cities throughout the county. Not that businesses will get everything that they want, but so you know how to answer the questions when businesses come to you. Representative Beard, what do you think the role of the Scott County Board should be in order to encourage local job growth? Well, Rob, as I mentioned before, Scott County is blessed with one of the lowest tax rates in the state of Minnesota, the lowest in the metro area uh, for sure. We're also blessed with um, foresight. We're standing on the shoulders of those who went before us and developed the industrial park in the old Eagle Creek Township, which is now out on the east end of town. 
we're running out of developable land for industrial and commercial purposes. One thing the county can do is work with the cities and the townships for orderly annexation, zoning and land use planning so that we can develop the next Eagle Creek Township Industrial Park for Scott County. There's a couple places that that can happen and know that that's already in the works. Making sure that our transportation access uh, to all points of the compass uh, stay robust, open and uncongested is also another thing the county board can do. But applying rules, regulations in a reasonable and thoughtful um, manner is also very important. We're fortunate in that the people in Scott County are actually glad to see developers coming, glad to see new businesses come to town and to react enthusiastically in that. And the development community responds well to that. Mr. Andreasen, what do you think the role of the Scott County Board should be in order to encourage local job growth? Well, I think it's first, first of all, it's important for us to to have a, to develop a strong business dev environment, and where, where we we give tax incentives and that sort of thing to new business businesses coming in. The state of Minnesota has not done a good job that we've been losing jobs to other sta other states, um, and that affects the, the, affects us at the county level also. We need to be working with Greater Minnesota to promote um, the positive aspects of, of Scott County. Our transportation system needs to continue to be uh, upgraded and, and made better. And we've already got good things in place there, but continue to work on those things and promote those issues that will bring new businesses to Scott County. Commissioner Ulrich, what do you think the role of the Scott County Board should be in order to encourage local job growth? Well, Scott County has taken a step to be a leader in economic development, and we've had great success. We've, like I said already, we've had $450 million of new business investment in the last two years and 3,500 livable wage jobs. And that happened because we warmly have been welcoming business, we've been reducing the, uh, the streamlining the process, reducing the red tape, we've been uh, uh, keeping the tax burden as low as it could be, and we've been uh, working with the transportation infrastructure to make sure it really supports the, the business operations. And we've even tried something called economic gardening, where for existing business in our community wants to go to the next level, wants to take their business and expand, but they're not really sure all the steps. And we pair them with other businesses that have already done that. And other counties are looking at us because we are an absolute leader in this area of economic development. Representative Beard, you wanted a 30 second rebuttal. Um, Mr. Andreessen touched on something I just wanted to comment on. I want you to know that we consider this and that's the business of tax incentives. Folks, that's a tricky subject and one that you have to wield very carefully and with uh, the utmost respect. There are good Main Street businesses here that get no tax incentives and yet they continue to grow and prosper and labor every day, do their job with no complaint or little complaint, unless you're a legislator, then you hear the complaints all the time, but that's beside the point. We've, uh, we've issued some tax abatements. We've issued some cash grants and some loans through deed. Uh, know that these are troubling things. We have to consider it though because we're on a national playing field. Sometimes international other folks are doing it and we're caught in a hard place but know that as your commissioner I'll weigh that very carefully and we'll be very reluctant to hand those out unless it's completely necessary Ms. Barber I think that the abatement program, some of the programs we've used so far have been very good in getting some of these bigger businesses here. I think one thing that we need to keep our eye on is ways to uh, continue to retain and expand current businesses as well. And I do think that's something that the Scott County Board, especially within their own districts as their own district representatives going out to help their businesses or uh, identifying businesses that are in a good position for a retention and development program. We do have things like the Open for Business program and economic gardening and these opportunities. And it's something that if we do it proactively, we can be, continue to be leaders in the economic development area. We're going to make this next question very easy for you and very difficult for you at the same time. It is simply this, Met Council, go. Representative Beard. <laughs> <laughs> Legislative Auditor, I asked him for a report on transit governance in the Twin Cities in 2010. When I was chair in 2011, he brought it back and he blew the doors off the entire legislature by saying transit governance is not your problem. The Metropolitan Council itself is dysfunctional. You should tear it down and start again. Amen. Mr. Andreasen. Met Council, do not enter. Allow us as county, county, county uh, government and uh, as a county to dictate our own needs and uh, Met Council is not doing us any favors. Commissioner Ulrich. 
Boy, I've had a lot of experience with the Met Council being on the Transportation Advisory Board, which is part of the Met Council. It, the Met Council is staff dominated. The electeds mm -hmm. take a secondary role. It's just the opposite of the, of the way it should be. They're overreaching into all our areas of planning and, and growth. Um, they want to invest solely in the inner core at the expense of the suburban counties. They want to invest in the wrong things and, and, and our roadways, our highways will not be kept vital. Um, it's just, it's just something that has to be challenged. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And no matter what uh, viewpoint you have politically, um, I think all the electeds are coming to see that we play second fiddle to the staff at the Met Council. And so that has to change. Ms. Barber, Met Council, go. Obviously, it's a source of frustration for many people in Scott County and many people in the suburban outer ring counties. It's very urban centric. And, but that said, uh, we have to be careful how we challenge them. I think it's important that we get the message out there that, hey, we're getting led, left out of the deal here on some of these things. But we also have to recognize that we have to work with them. Uh, at this point, that's the way it's set up. And you can't necessarily get rid of what Met Council from the Scott County Commissioner's seat. Um, we have to find a way to make things work. I do think we need to be not shy about letting our voices be heard about what we need. But we also do have to find a way to make sure that we get some representation on the Met Council, which I think would be very significant. We haven't had someone from Scott County um, on the Met Council, and I think it's always been one of our neighboring counties. And I think we need to advocate for somebody to step in and be a representative from our county on the board. Representative Beard, I think you wanted to make rebuttal comments? Uh, yeah, rebuttal or additional comment. Um, uh, in response to the legislative auditors report, it generated enormous amounts of discussion. I introduced House Bill 1403, which was a labor of a lot of different people and groups. Basically, it took the accountability for the Met Council, which largely isn't. We asked them to do a lot of things that affect our daily lives, but nobody is accountable because as uh, Commissioner um, uh, Ulrich, Ulrich, thank you, excuse me. Whoa, um, as Commissioner Ulrich mentioned, it is staff dominated. I turned that around to make elected officials. You have to have an election certificate at the local level to serve on the Met Council, make it dominated by the counties and the cities that are responsible and gonna be accountable for what happens. That bill got a couple of fantastic hearings and has gone nowhere because the legislature flipped. I'd like a rebuttal. Commissioner Ulrich. You know, I, I think working with the Met Council, we've tried that, and I will just say they have a divide and conquer mentality. They'll make sweetheart deals with one county over the other to try and break us apart and are, and are mm -hmm. trying to change uh, their control. And domination and control is what they're doing. Um, the only thing that's going fix, to fix this is changing the governance model of the legislature. And we, we need to be in a position where the electeds are in control of the Met Council, not the staff of the Met Council. Well, candidates, let's stay on the topic of, of roads and transit for just a moment um, and ask what is the right balance then between spending on mass transit versus uh, spending on roads? Mr. Andreasen, we'll begin with you. I think the balance between mass transit and our local roads and infrastructure are based on can they support themselves and what do they do for do for us? Ma mass transit in, in Minnesota has never supported itself. It's, it's been a, a, a black hole for for for, ta for taxpayers, and it's, it serves strictly the you know the, the urban core. Um, our roads, I think we need to put, put more investment into our roads long term, uh, bike paths if that be the case, um, but roads for infrastructure, especially for us in this county, um, for business development and for residential development as we continue to grow as a county. Uh, I think it's important that we have, there's still corridors that we need to put uh, time into and look at for on the east-west side and on north-south uh, bound roads for business development within the county. So I put the focus on definitely on our, our roads as opposed to the mass transit. Commissioner Ulrich, what is the right balance between spending on mass transit versus spending on roads? Well, I'll tell you, we have to spend a lot more on our highway system to reduce congestion, eliminate bottlenecks, and, and our economy is dependent on that. Having said that, I do support a express bus service. I've been on the MBTA for 14 years. I've been past chair of the MBTA and vice chair now. I've been chair of the Scott County Transit Review Board since its inception. So I support uh, an efficient, well-run express bus service. We do 11,000 rides a day between uh, MBTA and our Blue Express. And I encourage the merger of those organizations and the efficiencies of those organizations. So I support that. What I don't support is this 
heavily subsidized transit ways like North Star, where the, right now I think the on-time rate is about 30%, and the uh, subsidy is in the $20 per each ride, something like that. And I don't support that massive subsidy and, and very uh, inefficient uh, type of transit. Ms. Barber, what is the right balance between spending on mass transit versus spending on roads? Well, first we have to have an understanding of what we actually spend on roads currently in Scott County and what we spend on transit. Roads right now, our budget's been cut in 50% from what it once was, and so we're very at the low end from what, where we probably should be. Uh, and then also when it comes to transit, we spend no levy dollars at all on mass transit. Now, um, I agree, I don't think we need light rail coming to Shakopee but rapid bus lanes would be helpful. And you look at some of these things, they're generational. And it's honestly with the aging population and with uh, younger people, they're looking to mass transit solutions or some type of transit solutions. And so it's definitely something that we need to make sure is at least in the mix. As far as transportation funding, this does is an issue going forward. Um, there are new restrictions um, coming down from Met Council on roads funding, things that we had benefited from, the policies we had benefited from uh, previously. Um, are no longer going to be in place and that will be a challenge. And so we will have to look at new ways to uh, find funding for roads. Representative Beard, what is the right balance between spending on mass transit versus spending on roads? Well, at the moment, about 5% of our population uses transit, some sort of government transit, um, in, in their daily lives. Uh, that means 95% of us are dependent on our automobiles because we don't have lives that start here and go there and on, uh, on a regular basis. Mobility gives us an amazing amount of liberty and prosperity. We are the most mobile nation on the face of the earth, also the most prosperous. My goal as the transportation chair was always to get maximum mobility for the tax dollars that we got from the taxpayers, whether they're user fees or taxes. We want to spend them as efficiently and effectively as possible. You can make a case that there, a case for transit because some of us can't drive, shouldn't drive. We might be blind, we might be old, we might have DWIs, whatever the case is. We depend on somebody else to move us around. That can be accommodated efficiently and effectively, and that's what I would watch for. I will say this too, a road and a bridge is used not only by people in automobiles, it's used by mass transit. Everybody wins whenever you have effective roads and bridges. So I would keep our spending on that. I wanted to say also, the MBTA uh, merger that's coming, excellent way to spend taxpayer dollars in increased transit. Candidates, we come to our final question for this evening. S Scott County has become a very diverse county. How well are we doing at welcoming different types of people and should we do more? You see us a C entonces K, or in other words, if so, then what? Commissioner Ulrich, we'll begin with you. One thing that I've tried to do as a, a county commissioner is, is figure out a way that we can meet human need outside of government or meet human needs before they come to government. So I helped found, I uh, was a founding member of FISH, Families and Individuals Sharing Hope. And, and we, we have had many meetings with the, the diverse population in the community. Our, our monthly meetings have focused on uh, cultural diversity and how, what needs does the, the different uh, communities have in, within Scott County and, and how can we as a, as, a, as a partners meet those needs, how can we help the, the people in the community. So we've met with uh, the Russian community, uh, the Hispanic community, and uh, the Somali community and uh, so we're, we're working on that and we're building understanding and, and what the needs are and how can we meet needs outside of government that do come up within those communities. Ms. Barber, how well are we doing at welcoming different types of people? Should we do more? And if so, what? I think there's definitely things we can do more. Shakopee is one of the most diverse cities um, in the metro. And uh, with our population here, I've been out and uh, both as uh, one of the original people who was involved in the Shakopee Diversity Alliance, uh, meeting with people from different backgrounds, whether uh, ethnic or socioeconomic diversity. And they've all mentioned that there are issues when they try to work with the county, whether it's through Health and Human Services, the Customer Service Department, um, having access to information, information in their right language. I look back even a few years ago, um, public health is a big issue right now with the number of things you hear in the news. And 
and it was the H1N1 crisis. I was on the Community Health Advisory Board. And no, coming, having my children in the Shakopee School District where I knew at that particular time, my son's class was about 40% English language learners. And they were trying to get information out to the community for vaccinations. And so it was there that I advocated for people to get the information out in multiple languages. And we ended up being one of the highest rates of vaccinations in the state because the information got out there and people responded to it. Representative Beard, how well are we doing at welcoming different types of people? Should we do more? If so, what? Well, folks, as we stand here tonight, I had a choice to make. The Diversity Alliance is having a meeting downtown. I was asked to go to that, or I could come here and speak to you folks. I opted to do this because I can have coffee with them, I guess, next month. And we have met in, the, in the, just the recent past with uh, some of the Hispanic pastors in town. But I want to remind you that the United States of America is a land of opportunity. People aspire to come here because they want to better their lives for their own families. It's not a land of free stuff. It's a land of opportunity. And the people that I fight for and look for are the people who want to come here, play by the rules, and make their way because they are looking out for their own families and their own selves. I tend not to see people as interest groups. I tend to see them as individuals. I tend to see them and their passion for their families and the gifts that God has put in their hearts that they want to work with in a land like the United States, in a land like Scott County. So as a commissioner, I would be cognizant of the different cultures are here, but I would recognize that a common language is the best thing we can do to help assimilate people into our culture and help us understand and appreciate their culture. So the extent I could do that as a commissioner, I would be working to do that. Mr. Andreas, and how well are we doing at welcoming different types of people? Should we do more? And if so, what? I think we should be doing more. I think we are doing a good job. Um, again, my in my volunteer work coaching, I run into kids from all races and ethnic backgrounds and uh, uh, social levels. And uh, like uh, Mr. Beard here, I have a, I see the person as an individual first and foremost, and I look at them as, you know, this is a person with, all, with a lot of potential, and I always give them the benefit of the doubt before anything else. Uh, concern, one of the things that I think we need to work on and change is the whole idea of assimilation of different cultures into, into our life in the United States. When people here move to the United States, yes, we're the land of opportunity, a land of freedom, a land of, land of choice, but we want people to be, uh, come a part of that. And I see too many of the uh, communities coming, coming in and, and uh, just developing their own little, little, little village or their own little country within our, within our place and not really uh, assimilating into our life as Americans. And I think down the road that can cause some troubles it already has. And with some of the things that we're seeing now with uh, terrorist activity in Canada and the U.S., I think that's something that we need to be aware of. We need to work harder to assimilate people into our, into our culture. Ms. Barber, 30 seconds for rebuttal. I just want to say that I think in Shakopee, we were very proactive in how we looked at this, knowing that uh, just as people can learn from the American culture, we can learn from other people's cultures. Mm -hmm. We're all immigrants, and we all learn from each other. That's what created this great experiment we have going in the United States. And so I think what we have done in reaching out and trying to engage people to bring them together as part of the community, it gives us the opportunity to learn from each other and it improves our entire community together. Well, our time is running out this evening. Anyone whose questions have not been answered this evening should ask the candidates after the debate or contact their campaign offices. You can also find more information about our candidates at the Chamber's website, shakopee.org. Each candidate will now have one minute for their closing statements, and we will begin with Representative Beard. Thank you, Rob and friends. It's been an honor to serve you in state legislature these last 12 years. We talked about term limits. Mrs. Beard enforced term limits on Representative Beard. I was done serving in St. Paul, whether this seat opened up or not, and I need to make that very clear. If Mr. Menon had chose to run, I was moving on to other things. The seat is open. I enjoy Scott County. I'm proud of Scott County. I've served with a lot of the people that are here. It's a well-run county. My Reputation in my career of public service, I'm putting before you again tonight and on November 4th, saying I have wisdom and experience I'm willing to and excited about investing on behalf of Scott County as we navigate the uh, backwaters of dealing with the Metropolitan Council and state government, and as we continue state, uh, Scott County's uh, path as an excellent, well-run place to raise your family, educate your kids, and grow your business. I ask for your vote on November 4th, and I thank you again for having us here this evening. Mrs. Barber. 
Well, I also would like to thank the chamber. I would also like to thank Dave Menden for uh, whose seat we're vying for here. He uh, has been a commissioner and involved in the county for so many years, and so Scott o o County definitely owes him a debt of gratitude. Um, I bring to this my true desire to serve. I got involved in the community not to take a step ahead politically, not to, um, uh, not for any career goal specifically, but because I wanted to get involved in my community and I wanted to improve my community. And so what HAD has brought is my desire to serve. I looked at different roles and places and the Scott County Board seemed like a very good fit for me. The experience I bring with my business background, my engineering background, and my community ties, like I sat through this, the school the city and the county level, I think that I would be an engaged commissioner who would be willing to learn. And that's really what you want, and somebody who would be an active representative for the citizens of Sha Shakopee on the Scott County Board. And I ask for your vote on November 4th. Thank you so much. Commissioner Ulrich. I serve on uh, over 25 different committees as a county commissioner. I'm fully engaged, fully invested, totally committed to the work of a, being a county commissioner. I enjoy it. I enjoy seeing the successes that we can celebrate together. Uh, over the years, I've earned respect and I've gained experience and I've, I'm trusted. I'm a, I'm a voice that uh, people listen to. Many of these committees that I'm on, I've been selected to be chair or vice chair uh, and I've put in leadership roles. and. Uh, I'm ready to, to keep on serving with my full effort, with all my energies, and my, my I really enjoy serving Scott County and the people of Savage, and I ask for your vote again of support on November 4th. Thank Mr. Andreasen. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here also. Um, I come to you as, as a citizen, I have not, no uh, political background at all, um, and have experienced a lot of the ups and downs that many of you have experienced over the la last number of years with the ec economy here in the county and within the city of Savage. Um, I feel compelled to, to, to put my voice in and to be heard on, on the council and to serve in the council. Um, and I'm a tr trusted and well-known individual in the Savage area. You can't go very far without somebody knowing who I am and, and, and what I'm up to. I've always been trusted the 20 years of doing things. Um, one of the issues that, uh, the reasons I'm, I've joined, or running, running for this position, is there are some issues at, at the county level on the county board. And uh, we, we have, a, we have d dissension within the board itself, and I don't think they're serving the county as well as they could because of some, some of the dissension that exists there. And my opponent has, has been embroiled in that um, over the years, and I think it's important um, that we make the changes necessary to continue to serve this fine county. Well, as we bring this part of tonight's forum to a close, let me remind you that the views expressed in tonight's debate are those of the candidates, not those of the Chamber and Visitors Bureau. The Chamber is sponsoring this event as a service to the community and has gone to great lengths to ensure the objectivity of this forum. The chamber does not endorse any candidate but seeks to provide you, the citizens and voters of Scott County, with the information you need in order to make an informed choice. We want to say thank you to the audience this evening, to our host, the Shakopee Public Schools, and to Shakopee Kids Voting. And then on behalf of the Shakopee Chamber and Visitors Bureau, thank you as well to our candidates. We appreciate your time and your service to our community by running for office, you are performing an important service to us all. Thank you so much, candidates. Election day is Tuesday, November 4th. Please remember to vote. We'll now take a brief intermission while we prepare for our House District 55A candidates. Thank you and good evening.